Morning, everyone. So at the start of classes, I'll often put up slides like this just to remind you of other services that are available at ASU. So this is the career services um, where you can go and talk about what you want to do in six months from now when you're graduating, as many of you are seniors. So uh, hopefully that helps. Okay, let's start off talking about the bonus question from last week. <clears throat> so the first thing is talking about what the vaccine and the virus share in this case. So remember, we're talking about smallpox and then using cowpox or vaccinia virus as a vaccine for smallpox. And that, that does violate the specificity rule of the uh, immune system and that you should only be making a response to vaccinia, not to smallpox. But turns out when things look sort of similar, when you make antibodies to vaccinia virus, some of those antibodies and T cells will cross react with the actual pathogen, in this case, variola virus. Not all of the an antibodies will cross react, but some of them will, and that's what provides the protection. And so they must share an epitope, or they must share ep epitopes between them. So the bonus question was, um, what el other uh, vaccines violate this principle? And it turns out it's quite common. And in fact, um, it's thought now that people who had uh, SARS-CoV-1 or SARS-CoV are somewhat protected against SARS-CoV-2 and so, or co what we call COVID-19. And so some of the other answers that we got were things that are not necessarily different, but they are different variants within a species. So there is cross protection between different variants of influenza virus, particularly when you have antigenic drift. Um, and so there, that does provide some protection. Also with papillomaviruses, there's many different clades of papillomavirus and vaccines against one can cross protect against other clades. So this is quite common. Um, either for viruses or bacteria. But there are also ones that are completely different species. Um, and so um, immune responses or a vaccine against tick cement protein, which is a common allergen, if you generate antibodies to that, you can actually um, also recognize other proteins from other tick species. An interesting one in terms of allergies is there's cross-reactive responses between birch pollen and apples, totally unrelated. They're both plants, but they share epitopes that are cross-reactive. And then there are, are a number of other ones, and you can see that Mycobacterium bovis present, uh, can be used as a vaccine against Mycobacteria tuberculosis. Um, and, th and this goes down the list. There's lots of different versions of this. But I, what I want to caution you is most of the time, they're pretty closely related. So for example, Hantan virus and Andes virus are both Bunya viruses. They're in the same family. Zaire and, and uh, Bundibugyo virus are in the same family. So they, you can't get too far away um, most of the time. It's usually within this sort of the same family. Okay, are there any questions on the bonus question? All right. So today we're going to talk about the cells of the immune system and sort of what we laid out in the last lecture are what are the rules. And so if you think about this as a pick your favorite sport, first we define the rules and then we say what are the roles of the different players. And what I hope you'll take home from this lecture is that all the cells have definite jobs. Okay, just like uh, in a baseball game, the pitcher has a job, the catcher has a job. Um, and so that's really what we're going to frame this as. Okay, so we introduced the concept of hematopoiesis. This is the generation of your white blood cells. It actually includes generation of your red blood cells and, and platelets. But you have hematopoietic stem cells. And these typically are, or there really are non-embryonic embryonic stem cells. And what differentiates a stem cell from a regular cell is that a stem cell has the, the ability to 
reproduce itself or give rise to other cells. So they have these two things, self-renewal and differentiation into subsets. So a stem cell basically can go and make more stem cells and it retains the capacity to give rise to all the different other ones. But once you become a progenitor cell, those cells are now committing to a, a specific lineage or a specific kind of differentiation. And so a progenitor cell can't go back to a stem cell, but a stem cell can give you more stem cells. Now, your hematopoietic stem cells exist in the, in the red bone marrow. And in children, this is typically in the long bones of the leg and the, and the arm. But as you age, that changes and then it goes primarily to the flat bones. So if you've ever gone to donate bone marrow, they'll take a long needle and they'll put it into your hip or your, your pelvis. You can also get it from your sternum, but um, it's really ends up being in the, in the long flat bones. Now the hematopoietic stem cells give rise to all of the cells of the immune system. And this includes the myeloid cells, the leukocytes that mainly do the jobs of the innate immune system and the lymphoid cells, which are mainly concerned with doing the adaptive immune system, but they also cooperate, okay? And so the, there are several steps in this process and we're not going to, in this class, go into all of the um, details about how that works. Clearly there are, are commitment steps and in the advanced immunology class, we, we talk about what those signals are that tell the cell which way to go. Okay. But for the purpose of this class, I don't think it, it, we really need to go into that big of a discussion about what are the signals that give up, that tell the cells to become each of these. Now, an interesting property of stem cells is that you can artificially differentiate these cells into other cell types. And that is this sort of stem cell definition. And so hematopoietic stem cells have been differentiated into neurons, into muscle cells, into um, other types of, of cells, but that's only in a lab. Normally they don't give rise to those cells. So it's just an artificial uh, ability. Okay, so if we start with a hematopoietic stem cell, the first choice it has to make is whether it wants to become a common myeloid progenitor or a common lymphoid progenitor. Now there is one additional step in between there that I'm not showing, but I don't think that it matters. It becomes a, a uh, common precursor. But in any case, the, the first decision or the branch in the pathway is between lymphoid and myeloid lineages. Once that cell goes to that progenitor, it can't go back to becoming a stem cell. Now, something that we're not going to talk a lot about in this class are the um, generation of erythrocytes and platelets. Those have a specific pathway and they are part of the immune system, particularly your erythrocytes are, are carrying oxygen, but they also signal a lot. They have, they have the potential to activate other parts of the immune system. And platelets all obviously are involved in wound healing, but they too can, can have activating properties for the immune system. What we're really gonna focus on are the other cells that come from the myeloblast, okay? So if you have, go down this common myeloid progenitor pathway, the first branch is sort of become between red blood cells and megakaryocytes, which give you platelets, and going down to the myeloblast. And what we really are gonna focus on are what are the cells that come from the myeloblast. And these are your granulocytes, which are your neutrophils, basophils, and, and eosinophils, and they are monocyte and macrophage lineages. There are others, but these are the main ones. And we'll talk about some of the variants of these, for example, a macrophage is, is derived from a monocyte. They have different roles. Basophils and a cell called, type called a mast cell are, are in different places and they may be slightly different lineages, but they're very related. But we're gonna just focus on the main ones. Now on the other side of the equation, we have the common lymphoid progenitor. And this gives rise to your natural killer cells. And that includes both NK cells and NKT cells as well as your lymphocytes. And there are distinct signals between those two things. But you'll notice that, that of all of these cell types, the ones that sort of look the least interesting are the lymphocytes. But that's what we're gonna spend most of this course on is the adaptive immune system and how that works. 
Now, given that we look at this pathway, in reality, most of the cells that originate from the uh, originate from the hematopoietic stem cells are these guys. Well, I'm still working on this. And so if you look in your blood, your white blood cells are actually fairly rare. 90% of the cells in your blood are red blood cells. 9% are platelets, which are often difficult to see just through a microscope. And your white blood cells are only about 1% of the cells that are circulating. A big reason for that is that white blood cells spend really relatively little time in the blood itself. They do circulate through the blood, but they spend most of their time in lymph nodes and the spleen in, in immune organs. And so if you look in those places, they become major blood, uh, major cells. When you break down that 1% that's in the blood, or if you were to sort of look at what other cells are around, you have this hierarchy and most of the cells are neutrophils. Neutrophils are the, in humans are the most abundant white blood cell type. Um, and there's a reason for that that we'll go, get into. And then you have eosinophils and basophils, which are very low percentage, but they have their, that's partly because they're very potent cells. And they, they for example, basophils can <clears throat> cause um, basophils and, and mast cells are the cells responsible for type one allergy. And so if you go outside and you start breathing in Palo Verde pollen, it's the basoph basophils and mast cells that are making you feel uncomfortable. The remainder of the cells are monocytes and lymphocytes. And monocytes are sort of the precursors, they become macrophages, and then their job is really to clean up stuff. And we're gonna go through all of these different cell types. Okay, so let's go back to the first observation of immune cells. And I, if you remember, in the early 1900s, sort of 1905 to 1920, there was this real debate about what is the basis of immunity. And Ehrlich had said, it's this thing that's floating around in the blood, and you could transfer that and show immunity. And so it was some kind of antibody, it wasn't cellular. Metchnikoff, on the other hand, observed white blood cells engulfing bacteria in culture. Now this all started with him taking a sea star larva um, and inserting a little thorn into it. And this was so that he could actually see it. And what he observed that, that the sea star larva could actually attack and engulf and, and uh, make a response to that thorn. This led him then to looking at white blood cells engulfing bacteria in culture. Okay, so that was the, excuse me, the really first observation that immune cells had some job to do. Well, this didn't sit well with Ehrlich, right? He had, he had said, no, it's antibodies. And so he tried to disprove this. And so what he did is he took um, some staining protocols from Robert Koch, who was working on tuberculosis. And so these were things that could stain tuberculosis um, microorganisms and he used them to stain white blood cells. And so what he then started to do was distinguishing these cells just based on their colors in the stain. And the two that he used and, and which are still used today, um, if you ever heard the term H&E stain, which just is a stain for tissue or, or cells, it comes from hematoxylin and eosin. And so hematoxylin is a dye that's used or that is still used to dye fabrics and it's extracted from trees. But once it's taken up by cells, it then becomes oxidized and it stains the nuclei of cells and it's a dark purple color. Um, eosin on the other hand is a synthetic dye that is made in the lab and it's, its main use is in staining cells. And it binds to just sort of all proteins and it stains a bright pink. And so Ehrlich using these two dyes could start to distinguish different types of cells in the body or that he could isolate from blood. And his whole goal was to prove that these cells did not provide immunity. 
and he was trying to sort out which cells could do it. So this is sort of what it looks like. You have a cell will stain dark purple for, for nuclei and for um, granules or things that provide this oxidating um, environment. Whereas the cytoplasm sort of stains uh, a bright pink. So let's start with the innate immune cells. Okay, now remember, the myeloid cells have this job. They have, they have two jobs. They have provide the initial antimicrobial response, and their job is also to, also to inform the adaptive immune system, hey, there's something here that you should make a response to. And so that's really this lineage. And when we talk about what's in the blood, you really don't see myeloblasts in the blood. Those are still in the bone marrow, giving rise to these other cells. You don't see the common myeloid progenitors because those are obviously still in the bone marrow. So we're really talking about these five different cell types down at the bottom. You have granulocytes, which are the, the ones on the uh, left, the left three, and your monocytes and macrophages, which are the right two. Okay, so the granulocytes are often called polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Now, all that means is that the nucleus of these cells is multi-lobed or it has different shapes, okay? And they typically have cytoplasmic granules. And there's, there's three kinds. And they're one, the first don't have a lot of granules. Those are neutrophils. You have then ones that have, have granules that stain bright red and ones that stain bright purple. And so that is related to what's in those uh, granules and what the job of those cells are. In, and when we're talking about granules, we're really talking about uh, exosomes or things that are going to be, they're pre-made inside the cell. And as soon as that cell recognizes something it needs to respond to, it will then release those towards that, um, the recognized structure. Now the granulocytes are responsible for recognition and elimination of extracellular pathogens. So anything bigger than a virus or anything, you know, an extracellular bacteria or anything bigger is targeted by these uh, polymorphonuclear leukocytes or granulite, granulocytes, depending on which terminology you want to use. Okay, so this is really the three subtypes, neutrophils, eosinophils and basophils. And you can see they look very different. So let's talk about what each of their jobs is. But before we do that, we have to think about how are these cells going to recognize foreign things, right? And we had talked about PAMP receptors or pathogen associated molecular pattern receptors. And so there, there are a number of these different receptors uh, on these granulocytes or polymorphic nuclear cells. And the first group are the scavenger set receptors. And this is just a diverse family of proteins. There's something like, I think there's 11 families and each of those families has a number of members. And they're recognizing common polysaccharide or lipid structures that you don't have. Okay, so they're gonna recognize things like uh, glycosylation that, it, that a bacteria does, but you don't do. And so, they're, the, it's difficult for microorganisms to change those things without fundamentally changing their life cycle, okay? And so, so it's really just looking for common structures. So there's some sort of cartoon drawings of, of different scavenger receptors, and you can see they look very different, and that has to do with what they're recognizing. Um, it could be a lipid structure, so it could be uh, triacylated lipopolysaccharides, it could be um, you know, non-standard glycosylation structures. But there are also other kinds of receptors. And when we st start talking about innate uh, recognition, we'll go through all of these families. But I've just listed some of the more important ones here. So the first scavenger receptors just recognize a bunch of different um, sugars or, or lipids. Complement receptors are recognizing your self proteins. And so we have an entire lecture on complement. It's probably the most important and least appreciated part of the immune system. But the complement proteins in a nutshell are designed to bind to microbes and label them as this is foreign. And so a, a granulocyte can then recognize the complement receptor that's stuck, or sorry, the complement protein that's stuck to that uh, microbe 
and say, okay, it's labeled with complement. Yes, we're good to, to kill that. The other thing these cells have are FC receptors. And I realize we haven't gone through antibody structure, but they, the FC receptors bind to antibodies that are bound to microbes. And so this is part of how the immune system works. The adaptive system is going to make antibodies. And if they bind to those FC receptors, then the, the granulocyte knows that, yes, this is something that I should make a response to. And there's really two types. There are high affinity FC receptors, and this basically binds to the outside of the granulocyte and acts as a surrogate antigen receptor. So basically, that cell becomes committed to anytime I see this, I'm ready to go. The other one are low affinity, and this, this is the type of receptor where the cell has to wait till enough antibody is coding a microbe so that then it can bind to it and respond to it, okay? So, and we will go through in some detail what, how those different pathways work. Now, there are a, a number of other pathogen receptors, um, and they're toll-like receptors, nod-like receptors, rig-like receptors. We cover all of that later, but those are just specialized versions of these receptors that can recognize different structures and, and in different places inside the cell. We'll cover this more in future lectures. So let's talk first about the first responders. Okay, they're the most, the neutrophils are the most abundant granulocyte and white blood cell overall in humans. In other species, it's not, um, but it still has the same job. Okay, and so this is sort of a cartoon of it and a real life picture of four um, neutrophils floating around in some and some uh, erythrocytes. Now, there are really two main jobs for neutrophils. They are fun uh, phagocytic, meaning they can engulf bacteria and fungi and kill them. And they do produce a lot of toxic proteases and uh, pore forming proteins, the, uh, the different kinds of uh, protectins and, and things that we talked about last lecture. Um, and things that make reactive oxygen species and, and digest DNA and things. But that's not really their first job. If you think back to our definition of the cardinal features of an immune system where you have uh, heat, redness, swelling, and pain, if you think about that in terms of a zit, what that zit really is, is DNA from neutrophils. Okay, or the pus inside of that zit is DNA from neutrophils. And so what they do is they go to the site of infection. They're there first because they're the most abundant. They, they, have, um, they have lots of sensing mechanisms to go to sites of infection. They show up and basically what they do is explode. They release their DNA into that environment and DNA is quite sticky. And it basically forms a net and this is only was only discovered within the last 10 years of these extracellular neutrophil extracellular traps or nets. Okay. And what that looks like is that the, once the neutrophil recognizes microorganisms, either bacteria, yeast, uh, fungal infections, or some protozoa, it's going to disassemble its nucleus. Okay, and, and basically it, it decondenses its chromatin. Remember chromatin, the DNA is packed together in histones and wound and wound, and it just, um, does, it just decon decondenses all of that chromatin. So you've just got loose DNA. It also dissolves the nuclear membrane. And so essentially what this cell has is a ton of DNA in its cytoplasm, and it's, it's going to release that. It basically explodes and releasing all of this chromatin or all the DNA towards whatever it just recognized. Now the other thing it's doing is that the DNA is fusing with the intracellular granules and so these granules have toxic things. They have the uh, peroxidases, they have uh, pore forming proteins and so it's sort of a very deadly net which is it's engulfing all of those microorganisms, but it's also um, giving them toxic proteins and, and substances. 
okay? So neutrophils really are sort of like a time bomb. They're sitting there waiting. As soon as they recognize something, they explode with their DNA all over it. And hopefully that prevents that microorganism from moving around to the rest of the body. It also helps kill it. Now the second group are the eosinophils. And these are really important for responses to larger um, microbes, such as, as uh, helminths or worms. They're very low frequency, but they're very potent. Um, and you can kind of tell that just because they have lots of these bright red cytoplasmic granules. And those granules have lots of, of nasty things in it, including uh, proteases, they have histamine, so it can increase your capillary permeability. And then they have all of these other things that are going to break down DNA and break down membranes and, and uh, kill whatever they're seeing. Now, eosinophils are very important for killing large things like parasites. They're also important in responses to tumors. But they use mainly these low affinity um, uh, antibody receptors called IgG FC receptors to recognize antibodies that are already bound to that parasite or to you know that larger microorganism. And so what they're doing is once they recognize something, so here on the right is a helminth, which is a large parasite compared to, um, to your cells. And in fact, this is not really drawn to scale. These cells your immune cells would be little tiny circles on here. It's just blown up so you could see the antibodies. And so once you have enough antibodies coating the surface of these parasites, then the uh, eosinophils will come in and they dump their, their uh, granules and right onto the helmet to kill it, okay? And that's really their only job. They're not very important for intracellular uh, bacteria or viruses. Their main job is for large things. And so you don't really use a lot of these, but people in, in underdeveloped countries where uh, parasitic infections such as helminths are, are prevalent, really uh, eosinophil activation is quite common. Okay, now this, this degranulation is quite toxic. And so it can also result in killing of host cells, particularly um, if the, the worm infection is, is widespread and you can it'll actually uh, can result in host death. I have a quick question. Yes. As opposed to the neutrophils that end up dying, um, do these eosinophils die when they release uh, these uh, lysozymes? It's not quite lysosomes. It's not really known. And it certainly becomes a toxic environment. But in most of the time when a cell is degranulating, what it's doing is using those, those receptors that have told it, here's, here's what you need to kill. And the degranulation is away from the cell and typically is making proteins that protect itself. But there is some uh, eosinophil death in the process. So uh, I also have a question. Yeah. Uh, in areas where there are more issues with uh, helminth infections and other kinds of large parasites, has anyone ever done a study to find out if people who live in those regions and have uh, historical ancestry in those regions, uh, if they have more eosinophil expression than people who don't live in those regions? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would guess that somebody has probably done that, but I don't know the answer to that. And uh, if you remind me, I will try to find an answer to that. Okay, Certainly, it's, it's difficult to know. Okay, so there's one, are people genetically from, are people from those regions genetically predisposed to making more eosinophils versus once an eosinophil recognizes a pathogen, it will proliferate. And so they may have more eosinophils anyways, because they're making responses. And that's, you can sort of see that in this, this video, which I know doesn't show up in your lecture notes, but here's a helminth, right, a parasite. And all the little red things here are eosinophils that are recognizing this. And you can see that they start, they recognize it and they're attracting lots of other eosinophils. So there is some cell division here, 
but you can see if you just sort of zoom in, once the recognition starts, you can see all the other ones zooming in towards this. And they're all degranulating and killing this, uh, and killing the parasite. Okay, so the last group of granulocytes are the basophils. And we're going to lump together mast cells with basophils because they act very similarly. I think most immunologists would say they're a distinct lineage. It's not a basophil, it's not necessarily a precursor for a mast cell. But the difference is basophils are circulating in the blood. Mast cells are tissue resident versions. They just sit up typically in your lungs and, or in your mucosal surfaces and they just wait for, uh, wait for microbes to come in. Now basophils look very different than the other um, granulocytes, than neutrophils and eosinophils, because you can see that they have dark purple granules inside them. And that's because they have a slightly different job. It depends on the acidity of, in those um, granules. But they're really um, cells that are responsible for sort of, um, well, mostly what we have, we blame them for are allergies. And so, their job is to recognize things like parasites and tumor cells and degranulate, but they use a different kind of receptor. They use a high affinity FC receptor called the IgE receptor. And then what this does is, is instead of waiting for antibodies to bind to the parasite, the uh, basophils will decorate itself with the antibodies so that if um, it recognizes the parasite, it's, it's just gonna automatically go. Now that the granules on basophils and, or inside basophils and mast cells do have all of those nasty things of, of lipases and, and DNA ases, right? That are going to kill whatever they recognize. But they also have this one other thing. They have histamine, which you remember from, if anybody who has allergies uh, recognizes that, this is the thing that makes you feel congested when you get an allergic response. And histamine has a very important job in the immune system. It's there really to increase capillary permeability so that cells can get from the blood into the tissues and start attacking whatever is there. And so basophils are, are basically, the difference between basophils and eosinophils is mainly in the receptor and sort of this additional step of, of histamine release. We look back at at, uh, at eosinophils, they do have histamine, but their main job is, is not to, that's not what they, they mainly produce. They mainly are attacking things with these other uh, peroxidases and, and ribonucleases. Basophils are not as good as killing parasites, but they are good at signaling to other cells, hey, there's something here um, and get over here. I have a quick question about that. Um, if antibodies are coming primarily from the B cells, how are they, is there a communication going on with the, um, with the basophils or are they producing antibodies themselves? The antibodies come from B cells. And that's a question that we're going to have to come back to because there's different sources of antibodies. For example, if you've never had that particular infection before, how do you have antibodies to it? Um, it, certainly, if you've had that infection before, then you've made a B cell response, you made antibodies, and now the, the B cells have produced antibodies that are free to bind to your granulocytes. If you've never had the infection before, you have what are called natural antibodies. These are low affinity antibodies that um, are produced during fetal development that recognize just broad charged structures on microbes. They're not very good, but that at least gets the ball rolling for a lot of this. Okay, so- um, I have a question about neutrophils. Sorry, um, so you said something about like how they could actually like end up destroying themselves when like they, um, or they do destroy themselves. Like I was wondering if like that other, like healthy cells around it get affected by that. And like, if they do, could that like lead to like cancer if it happens too much or something? Well, it certainly, it certainly causes inflammation, right? If you've ever thought 
we go back to the example of a zit. Part of that is it's inflamed. It's red, it's, it's painful, you know, it's swollen. And so that inflammation is, um, can do tissue damage. If you have constant inflammation, that can be bad. However, we also know that if you have sustained inflammation, then um, you can get cancer, right? Because your cells are, are under stress and they start trying to change things and, and that can uh, be tumorigenic. I'm not aware of any cases of, of prolonged neutrophil activation that is directly linked, or directly linked excuse me, to a particular cancer. But just given what we know about general inflammation, that certainly could be the case. Okay, so let's talk now about, uh, if there's no other questions, let's, let's move on to the other white meat or the, you know, I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember those pork commercials. Um, but the other part of the monocytes that we're really gonna focus on, or, or the other part of the myeloid cells that we're gonna focus on are the monocytes and macrophages. Now, in reality, we make this sort of differentiation between monocytes and macrophages, but one can become the other, okay? So monocytes can become macrophages. Monocytes are more prevalent in the blood. You can have macrophages in the blood, but most of the, this lineage, if it's in the blood, is a monocyte. If it then gets into tissues and it becomes activated, it becomes a macrophage. And a macrophage looks very different than a monocyte. It looks, it's sort of, you think of it as, as a angry monocyte. So we make this distinction in reality, they both can be in blood and tissues, but monocytes are more prevalent in blood and macrophages are more prevalent in tissues. And they look pretty different. And so I have sort of a cartoon drawing here of both a monocyte and a macrophage. And then if we look in, in the um, actual micrograph here, you see a monocyte and it looks different than a macrophage. It's got less cytoplasm. It's got a, a nucleus. It's often sort of in this kidney bean shape and it doesn't look activated. And we make it short as well. However, monocytes can be uh, phagocytic and they recognize these microbes by uh, antibody receptors, by scavenger receptors, complement receptors. And they have to express all of them because their, their job often is to clean up the mess after all the neutrophils that are, have exploded and the granulocytes have, have uh, degranulated and they've got to clean up the mess. And so they have to rec recognize all the different parts of the microbe. Now, this is basically once everything's been killed or you have these responses, that's a process uh, that the microbes get coated with either antibodies, complement, or or other uh, products, and that's called opsonization, or the, the pathogen has been opsonized. And this is a German word that means to relish or to butter. It's, it's often called to, to butter, but it's basically to make something more, uh, more eatable by the macrophage. Now, monocytes have an important job. They are responsible for a lot of the early uh, proteins in inflammation. So they provide key signals that tell other cells what to do. They also are important for cleaning up the mess. But, but uh, if you remember anything about macrophages, think that their job is to, is to come in and clean up um, and, and eat up everything that, that is killed. And we'll talk about some of the other jobs that macrophages do, particularly in informing the adaptive immune system how, uh, how to make a response. Um, we'll to cover that later. Okay, now there's one cell type that we haven't talked about, and it actually includes a lot of different types of cells, and that is the dendritic cells. These are derived from hematopoietic stem cells, and I put them here because they are the bridge between the innate and adaptive immune responses. Dendritic cells job is to tell the adaptive immune response, here's what you need to make a response to. And in particular, 
It does this for T cells. Um, and so dendritic cells are these sort of spindly looking ones. We often draw them as sort of starfish looking, but they actually look um, more like the cells on the right. You can see they've got all these little tendrils sticking out, dendrites, which of course is where they get their name. And so they're, they're like little fuzzballs and their job is to, is to inform T cells, and particularly T cells, here's something here. They are then, because of that, they are the main antigen presenting cells for initiation of adaptive immune responses. And that includes um, T cells, which are activated by sort of conventional dendritic cells, as well as B cells, which are activated by a particular type of, of dendritic cell called a follicular dendritic cell. They don't have a lot of features. They're, um, I mean, uh, staining features. They basically stain like any other normal cell but they do have these long arms. And so they're, they are differentiated by their, how they look or cell morphology. Now their job is you have in every surface of your body, in all of your, uh, in all of your epithelial layers and all of your organs, even in your blood, you have these dendritic cells that are sitting there and they're just penocytosing whatever is around them. They're taking it in. And so, as soon as they get a signal, they say, aha, whatever I took in, I'm going to go and present that to T cells, and hopefully the T cells can recognize it. Now, there are a lot of different types of dendritic cells, and we'll talk about some of them later in the semester. We're not going to differentiate between all of them because they all have similar jobs, um, but they do have some different versions, and some are involved, are involved in in T cell development, uh, initiating T and B cell responses. Uh, some of them are involved in, are not very good at presenting antigen, are more involved in, in uh, making proteins that direct uh, an immune response. And these can be either from myeloid or lymphoid progenitors. You have, you have lots of different types of dendritic cells. So what's happening is these cells are sitting in, the, in your tissues and they're sampling their environment, saying, okay, what's here? And they're just taking in whatever's around them and presenting that, or, or just, just taking it in and degrading it. But once they get a signal from your other myeloid cells, from your macrophages or your granulocytes, um, they then stop penocytosing. They go to, to lymph nodes and stimulate your T cells and B cells. That's their whole job. So they're sort of like your intelligence um, gathering. They're like the CIA or FBI. I forget which one's supposed to be monitoring me right now. Okay, and so this term penocytosis is differenti differentiates the cells from phagocytosis. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, dendritic cells don't do phagocytosis very well. That's more of a job of of the granulocytes and macrophages, and, and in particular, the macrophages. They, phagocytosis is taking in a whole organism, engulfing it, degrading it, breaking it up, and not really um, just reusing all the products for its own use. And so this is really, the granulocytes and your macrophages do this. Dendritic cells, on the other hand, don't take up entire organisms. They take up bits of stuff. And so um, they're taking in proteins and soluble debris that's around them. It goes into vesicles that then fuse with lysosomes and, and uh, breaks up the products. So there are two different sort of versions. And you can see that in the upper panel that these are two are related. So if you think about this being a macrophage, that it's taking up a bacteria, it's degrading it, so it, it fuses with a lysosome that has low pH and all of these uh, proteases. It starts breaking up that bacteria and killing it, but then it sort of exocytoses a lot of this stuff. And it's a soluble debris, in particular, if there's an infection that's being taken up by, by your dendritic cells. So it's sort of a two-step process. Now we've, we sort of alluded to antigen presentation and dendritic cells are the only cells that are allowed to start an immune response or start a T, a, in particular a T cell response. 
And we will cover this in, in much greater detail later, but I just want to sort of talk about what antigen presentation for T cells means. Okay. So the first thing is you take in these proteins and you have to chop them up and you have this protein called or a set of proteins called the proteasome, which is good at taking unfolded linear uh, peptide or proteins and chopping them up into little peptides. So anything in the cytoplasm um, can be fed into this pathway. And this is a term that we'll, we'll use a lot is MHC. And that stands for major histocompatibility complex one. So let me say that again. Major histocompatibility complex one. This is a, a set of proteins that will take those peptides that got chopped up and put them on the surface of that, of that dendritic cell. And this is particularly for intracellular things like viruses or some bacteria. And that's going to be recognized by CD8 T cells, which we'll talk about in just a second. The other pathway is if it's taking in extracellular things, like um, during this penocytosis process, it will take those in and feed them into the lysosomal compartment, and it will load those, those chewed up peptides onto MHC2, or um, we'll go through the terminology later, but the proteins that are going to present these peptides to CD4 T cells. And the way to remember is one times eight is eight, two times four is eight. So you always know CD4 recognized class two and CD8 recognized class one. Okay, now these are two distinct pathways. When we talk about uh, the MHC1 path and the MHC2 pathway in, in the set, second section of this course, we'll sort of go over where they intersect. But this is just sort of so you understand that T cells are seeing these bits of broken down stuff that are presented on dendritic cells. Now I said dendritic cells are the only cells that can start an immune response. And that's because uh, macrophages and lymphocytes can also present antigen by these pathways, but they have to get the inflammatory signals from the immune response that's already started. And so they can contribute, but after the dendritic cells have said, yes, let's go. Okay, now we have this bridge now between the myeloid system or the innate system and the, the lymphoid or adaptive system, and that's the dendritic cells. So let's talk about what those adaptive immune cells do. Remember, the adaptive immune system is delayed. It's waiting for, it has to go through all these steps where the granulocytes have responded and started killing stuff, the macrophages have degraded, the, the dendritic cells have picked up those products, they've gotten uh, signals from, from the inflammatory environment to go to a lymph node, they arrive at the lymph node, and then they have to wait and screen through millions of T cells and B cells so that they, they find the right one. And so they can, that's part of this delayed effect. It takes several days for that to happen. And so it's a delayed response. However, once it gets started, this is the overwhelming response. And so if we think about, we go back to the difference between disease and infection. As this adaptive response kicks in, that coincides when, when you feel the sickest because this is the most powerful response. If you have all of the innate cells, but not the immune cells, you are severely immune compromised, right? That's essentially the, you guys remember the boy in the bubble? He had all of his innate cells and he could provide that first line of defense, but without the adaptive immune response, you're not gonna control infections, okay? So it's an overwhelming response to control whatever is infecting you. So the first pathway that we'll talk about is sort of this natural killer and natural killer T cells. And, and they are two different types of cells. They have slightly different jobs and slightly de different developmental pathways that we'll briefly cover later in the semester. But they're coming from a common lymphoid progenitor. And for the purpose of this class, for the most part, when we talk about NK cells, they, we're going to lump NK and NKT cells together because they have very similar jobs. They do very similar functions. 
the main difference is their development and natural killer T cells have a T cell receptor on them, but they function very similarly. So a natural killer cell has a large roundish nucleus. It's got um, cytoplasmic granules, but they're nowhere near what you see with granulocytes. They're more focused and that's because they have a different uh, job. They don't really um, produce all of these proteases and, and lysozymes and, and histamines. Their job is to actually kill abnormal or infected cells. Okay. Now these originally were called large granular lymphocytes. And it was thought when, when Ehrlich was doing these, trying to figure out what immunity really was, he thought these were the important lymphocytes because they were large, they're granular, they obviously have a function. If you have granules, that has to do something. And their job is not to recognize foreign things. Their job is to recognize abnormal self cells. And so they have a, a big job in killing the initial recognition and killing of infected cells and also of tumor cells, because you can think of tumor cell is an abnormal self cell. They, so there really is, that's their innate function, but they also have this adaptive function where once they recognize something, they proliferate. So they undergo division and differentiation. They, they don't recognize things though, like, um, a granulocyte or a macrophage does. They, they don't have all of these PAMP receptors or pathogen associated molecular pattern receptors. They are mainly relying on the expression of cell proteins to tell them whether or not that cell is normal or abnormal. If it's normal, it says, okay, you're free to go. If it's abnormal, it kills it. Now, in particular, in anti-tumor responses, these are the main cells that sort of get the ball rolling. But they have, if we compare that to the myelid cells we just talked about, they're not recognizing foreign stuff, they're recognizing self stuff, okay? And so they do, it's sort of like you have to have both in case you're, if you have a viral infection, these cells are more important because they're recognizing an, a virally infected cell will not express normal proteins on its surface. And you have to have the myelid cells because all of these uh, parasites or bacteria or things that are outside the cell, you have to recognize them directly. So we'll talk a little bit more about natural killer cells later and how it's a balance between a good signal and a, or a positive signal and a negative signal. Normal cells have both and the, the negative signal says, no, don't kill me. An abnormal cell only has the positive signal. And so that tells the natural killer cell to kill it. Now, if we go back to the, the cells that we're going to spend most of the semester on, at least three quarters of the semester, we'll be talking about lymphocytes, your B cells and T cells. And these were originally defined as by Ehrlich and others as small lymphocytes. They essentially thought these were either progenitors to the large granular lymphocytes, the NK cells that they thought were important, or they were cells that were on their way to, to senescence or becoming dormant and dying. And they, that's because they really don't have much cytoplasm they're not doing anything. Uh, they're sort of floating around. So the people didn't know that they were important at all. And so Ehrlich went totally down the wrong path and he was saying, that, well, yeah, you can have all of these granulocytes, but none of them provide immunity. Well, now we know he just missed the boat because he didn't focus on these small, unremarkable cells. But the reason for that is that lymphocytes have to different, proliferate they have to undergo lots of differentiation to go from being a naive cell that's never seen antigen before to becoming an effector cell, which is very potent. Now, if we remember from the clonal selection hypothesis, right, each of these cells has a unique or semi-unique random antigen receptor on the sur on its surface. It's not totally random. We'll talk about how the antigen receptors are formed uh, in the next section of the course. And, and these cells do something that's really different than any other cell in your body. They intentionally take their DNA and rearrange it on purpose. Now, normally we think of cutting DNA and repairing it as a bad thing. That's what cancer cells do. 
But lymphocytes also do this, and it's a regulated process, but it's, it's taking and making a semi-random receptor by scrambling the DNA a bit, okay? Now, these are the cells. They're not very, they're, uh, they are in the blood, but they don't spend most of their time there. In fact, if you just count up all of, the, of, all of the white blood cells in your body, these would be the majority, but they're not in the blood most of the time. They spend most of their time going from lymph node to lymph node and sort of they just use the blood to get there. And what their job is, is to keep circulating through the system to see if they can eventually find a dendritic cell that, or, or antigen on a follicular dendritic cell that they recognize. Okay, so we go back to the clonal selection hypothesis, right? We have our hematopoietic stem cell gives rise to all of these different lymphocytes, either B cells or T cells, and they have a unique receptor on them. And that. And this one, I just did it by color, right? Each color is, that means it's a different, recognizes something different. Now, if that cell sees antigen, for T cells, it would be antigen in the context of an MHC protein. For B cells, it's antigen on the outside of a follicular dendritic cell. Then those cells undergo lots of proliferation. In this case, we call it expansion. And they become effector cells. And so that's what provides the overwhelming response. Now remember, we talked about what a vaccine does is it's basically increasing the numbers of those cells. And so even though most of these cells, they go out, they expand, they differentiate, they go out and they do their job, the infection goes away, most of them die off. But you still end up with more uh, memory lymphocytes than you started with. And it can be as much as 10,000 times more. Okay, but notice, None of these other cells responded. So they were not specific for that pathogen or any epitopes from that pathogen. So we go back to Ehrlich. He was looking for what do these cells do? He was convinced that it was antibodies that were important. What he missed was that the B cells, these small unremarkable lymphocytes are the cells that make antibodies. These were originally identified in chickens. I don't know if you, many of you know, but a lot of immunology was, early immunology was done in chickens because they were trying to figure out uh, how, if salmonella is killing all the chickens, how do I make them immune? It was a huge uh, agriculture and, and sort of um, industrial application. And so these cells, uh, Bruce Glick and others, identified these cells that came from the bursa of Fabricus. Okay, if you're not familiar with that, it's because you don't have one, okay? It's, a, it's an organ that's unique to chickens, or sorry, to, to uh, game fowl. In mammals, it doesn't happen in the bursa of fabricus, it happens in the bone marrow. We were just lucky enough, they both started with B, so it's easy to remember. Okay, now these cells, as they're developing from a common lymphoid progenitor, rearrange their DNA to generate a B cell receptor. And this is essentially a membrane-bound version of an antibody, okay? So it sticks this on its surface, and then it goes and looks for whatever it's supposed to recognize. If it does that, then it, it becomes activated into a factor cell. There's several different types, and we'll talk about those later. But their main job of B cells is just to make antibodies. So what they're doing is they're going from lymph nodes um, into the blood, back into lymph nodes, back into the blood, and they're just circulating. And that's basically, if you think there, there's one in a million is specific for any given pathogen, it has to keep moving until it identifies the right, the, until it comes into contact with the infection. Once it does that, it becomes, there, there's two different types of effector cells. There are plasma cells, which just make antibodies. And there's some different kinds of plasma cells we'll talk about. And then some of those cells become memory cells. And the memory cells, just like we, we said for the other cell types, memory cells are just floating around waiting for that infection again. They can do it faster and there's more of them. The other ones are T cells, okay? And T antibody or B cell receptors or antibodies are recognizing structures, shapes. Um, 
And so it's sort of easy to understand, well, if it has the right shape and it fits the antibody, great, you're off to the races. T cells don't recognize shapes. They recognize sequences. And so remember these, these peptides or proteins are being taken in by dendritic cells, penocytose. They're being digested, whether it's from intracellular ones going through the proteasome or extracellular ones that are getting digested by fusing with lysosomes they're getting chewed up. And so there was a question, I think last class, well, the, if it's on the inside of a protein, does it prevent a T cell from seeing it? And the answer is no, it actually most or many T cell epitopes are derived from the inside of proteins because it's after they've been chewed up and made into little stretches of, of peptides. Now T cells get the, their name because they develop in the thymus and anybody, if you put your, your um, finger right over your heart, that's where your thymus is. You can go to the, uh, the farmer's market and buy sweet meat, that is thymus. And it's just an organ that is solely developed to make T cells. If you don't have a thymus, um, there, are certain, uh, there are certain genetic conditions where people lack a thymus and they don't develop any T cells because they need this structure. Okay, so T cells recognize peptides that are put onto MHC proteins. They are just like B cells. And in fact, when we talk about somatic recombination or B cell development, T cell development, it's the exact same process. They are rearranging their DNA to generate a T cell receptor. And this, you can sort of think this, this is similar for antibodies, but T cells don't make a soluble version. They don't secrete a T cell receptor. They're, that's because their job is different. And so they're circling just like a B cell. They go from the lymph to the blood uh, or lymph nodes to blood to lymph nodes to blood. And they're searching for antigen on dendritic cells. So once they see antigen, they proliferate extensively and they become effector cells. And there's two main types. There's types that are killers and there are types that are, uh, we often call them helpers, but they're really controllers, okay? And so you, you get the ones that are becoming killers are producing cytotoxic molecules so they can go out and kill cells. Um, and the other ones are, are begin producing cytokines to direct the immune response, tell it what kinds of things to make. Okay, so let's talk about our T cells. The first ones we talked about were the CD8 T cells, and those recognize peptide on MHC1 proteins. Those peptides are derived from intracellular cytoplasmic sources. And these are often called cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And that's not technically always correct because it's, they only become cytotoxic T cells after they've been activated. Before that, they're just naive CD8 T cells. Their main job, you know, the CD8 killer cells have just one job, go out, kill anything that's got that peptide on it, okay? And they, they do this very similarly. They have made these cytotoxic granules. And this turns out to be the same kind of granules that our NK cells have. And they express things that punch, um, that transport death pathways into the cell that they recognize. We will talk all, quite a bit about this later in the semester, about how, the, how that cell is being killed. But one of the things that it does is these CD8 cells will express perforin. And it was originally thought it's permeabilizing the membrane, that's why it gets its name, but it's really a transporter. And it transports um, a protein called granzyme into that target cell, and granzyme initiates the apoptosis pathway, okay? And it's, it's really telling that, that cell, you're infected or you're a tumor cell, you're abnormal, you need to just kill yourself. I know it's not very nice to put it that way, but that's what it's doing. So they really, they express perforin and granzyme in these cytotoxic granules. That can be if they recognize things, but they can also kill these cells by uh, cell surface receptors in the tumor necrosis family of proteins. And this includes um, FAS, 
ligand, which recognizes the fast protein on target cells. That's a protein that's not normally expressed on a normal cell. And so if this T cell comes and recognizes it, it's going to say, oh, yeah, we're going to kill you this way. They also can make cytokines that will bind to receptors on the target cell that can also tell that cell, yes, you need to kill yourself. Now, CD4 T cells are a little different. They typically don't want to become killers. Okay, their job is to control the rest of the immune response. They're going to recognize peptides from extracellular sources that are presented on MHC2 proteins. Now, in virtually every textbook that I've ever read, these are called helper T lymphocytes, but they're not really helpers so much as controllers. They were originally given the term helper because if you didn't have these, you couldn't get a B cell, a good B cell response, and so they helped the B cells. But what we now know is that they actually produce a lot of proteins called cytokines that direct the rest of the immune response. So for example, after this cell gets activated, it becomes, it can become different types of helper cells, or it can be what we call a T helper type one cell, a T helper type two cell, a T helper type 17 cell, and uh, you can thank Casey Weaver, the author of your textbook for that, because uh, he and Loring Harrington discovered these cells and it's really, to, it's the name from the cytokine they make. It would have been a lot easier if they just called it a T helper three, but whatever. They can also become what are called regulatory cells that stop responses. And this is determined by the strength of the inflammatory signals they get. So if there's no granulocyte or macrophage activation, and these cells recognize antigen and say, no, I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to stop responding. I'm going to prevent other cells from responding. I don't care at this point that you know all these different cytokines or what the direction is. This is just to introduce the function of these cells. If they get the most stimulation, they become T helper one type cells and they make potent cytokines, including interferon gamma. This activates other macrophages and NK cells, so it's a very strong response. If it gets weaker responses or other signals, it can become these other helper types, and they direct the other cells to do a different kind of job. Okay, now, the list here is not even complete. There are people who have described what are called Th6 cells and Th9 cells and other groups, and there's some overlap between some of these. So it's not important that you know all the different helper types there are just that they, they direct the response. So with that, um, which is more dangerous? A, uh, oops. Which is more dangerous? A helper or a killer? So what I would like you to do is if you, Okay, so if you think the killers are more important, give me a hands up or a thumbs up. Okay, has everybody figured out how to do that? You go to participants, you can, you can uh, give a thumbs up or a hands up. Okay, so in re I'd say a few votes for killers. Maybe a lot of you are uh, just listening passively. Okay, I'm gonna clear those. Who thinks the helpers are more dangerous? Okay, I got a lot of instant responses for that. You're right, they are more dangerous. The helpers control the killers. So if you've ever thought about, um, about there are certain serial killer teams where there's somebody who's actually doing the crime, but there's actually somebody else who's directing that person to do the crime. And so it's, or, or if you wanna put it in a mob boss setting, the mob boss is directing all everybody else. And so the helper cells are really 
the ones that tell everything, everybody else what to do. And they can prevent killers from working. They can prevent B cells from making antibodies. They can shut down dendritic cells. They can shut down granulocytes and macrophages. Or they can tell everybody to go full speed. And that really differentiates what type of immune response you get. Okay, in the, normally if we were to do this in person, we would, we would start um, uh, doing sort of hand raising and voting. But I wanna ask some questions. And I sort of frame this in terms of, of the current world. We each have a job. and the immune system, each cell has a job. So if you were to think, what are the first responders of the immune system, what would it be? So you can just unmute yourself if anybody has a, has a guess. Neutrophils? Yeah, it's neutrophils, right? Neutrophils are the most abundant. They're usually the first on the scene. They're the ones that are going to explode, get, cover everything with, with DNA, this decorated cytotoxic DNA, and it recruits everybody else. Now, I know the ambulance is not always the first responder, sometimes it's police, but, but the first responders are the ones that are going to say, here, there's something here that we need to deal with. What about these guys? Anybody? What is the job of security? We got a lot of dendritic in the chat. Okay. Um, so if you think about security, they're sort of waiting. They're not going out and, and responding to accidents. The job mainly is to wait for stuff and, and respond to it. They can call out other and recruit other uh, cells or other people in this case, but their main job is just to provide initial control. And so these would be your other granulocytes, your eosinophils and basophils. Their, their job more is to recognize something that's already there and try and stop it, provide that first line of defense. Now, these are security officers, they're not police, so that they're not the first responders, they're more like tissue resident cells or um, circulating cells that are going to try and control infection. And that's mainly their job is just control. Sorry, not all of these I, are perfect. Not all these are perfect question. analogies. Yes. Would you say that they're not dendritic cells because dendritic cells remain in the same environment or they, they mean remain in a tissue specifically and these are like circulating, I guess? The difference is if you look in the picture, I guess you can kind of see it, they have guns, right? If you were to say dendritic cells, dendritic cells don't kill anything. They don't have guns. And so that, that's the main difference, that a, a dendritic cell does a different job. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But if we use that analogy, these security officers are able to use lethal force or uh, non-lethal um, controlling force. That's what an eosinophil and a basophil does. It's, it's trying to uh, stop a situation, but they're not, they're not typically the first responders. What about these cells? Macrophages and monocytes. These are definitely macrophages and monocytes. They clean, come and clean up the mess. They do provide initial inflammatory signals, but, and they helped sort of activate things and transport things, but their main job is just coming in and cleaning up the mess. And in fact, if you look in the thymus, where a lot of developing T cells are dying, you have what are called tingible body macrophages. And they're, you just, what they're doing is they're eating up all of these dead, dead T cells and they're eating it so fast that they still have nu nuclei from the T cells in their cytoplasm. That is, that's what a tangible body is. All right, what about intelligence? They don't kill, they're just informing everybody else. Antigen presenting cells. Yeah, so these would be your dendritic cells, right? 
to inform the adaptive immune response, this is what you need to go after. Oops, well, I gave this one away. Hit the button twice. So you already have B cells that are making antibody. And they're really, antibody is just binding to stuff and trying to prevent it from moving to other parts of the body. And so we'll go a lot more into antibodies, but it, to me, the job of antibodies is just to limit stuff moving. And that's really more of this homeland security kind of idea. I know we don't enjoy going through to, to TSA at the airport, but that's sort of the same job an antibody does. It just screens stuff and if it binds, then it takes it out of circulation. I don't know why these animations didn't work. But anyways, um, so then we have sort of the killers, right? There's a, these are, I believe, Navy SEALs. I might be wrong about that, but, um, but you have sort of the special forces and, and army their job is to go out and provide an overwhelming response to something. And in this case, they're, um, these would be the killer cells. So they're CD8 T cells. Their job is to eliminate infected cells. Now, in this day and age, and I know it's not always fun to put this in military terms, but what I want to emphasize here is that these cells all have different jobs. And they use these different jobs to communicate with each other and to um, sort of fill into the next thing. And so the importance really is knowing what the cells are and what their job is. And a little bit about how they do it. So here's your next bonus question. And this will be up in Canvas uh, at least by 10.30, hopefully. Tell me what these cells are. This is just a picture of uh, a blood that was lucky enough to get five different types of cells. And based on what you know, you should be able to tell me what those different five, five different types of cells are. Again, it's not whether you get the answer right, it's just making a, a reasonable attempt to answer it. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Yeah, I had a, a quick question about the staining of uh, natural killer cells versus macrophages. Mm -hmm. um, other than the, the size comparison to the urethrocytes, I, I, can, I couldn't really tell the difference between the two. If you look at a monocyte, it doesn't have um, the, the number of granules that an NK cell has. So an NK cell has preformed granules. It, a monocyte is bigger a NK cell has typically a, a rounder nucleus where a monocyte nucleus looks more like a kidney bean shape, it's sort of bent in half. I also have a question about um, the dis distinguishing cell types. Um, so is the main difference between how the eosinophil and how the basophil looks is this, um, the color of the stain? Yes. Because it looks like they both have maybe like a bilobe nucleus. Yes, in fact, that's where the name comes from. For, for eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils, they have a multi-lobed nucleus that is clearly separated by sort of a, almost a string or a little tiny piece of, of the nucleus. Whereas a monocyte the nucleus can kind of be folded in half or kidney bean shape, but it's not really, still is clearly the same part of the nucleus. So all of the granulocytes or polymorphonuclear cells have, have a nuclei that is multi-lobed. And so the nuclei for eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils all look very similar. Can you go over again why the um, cytoplasm slash granules of the neutrophil and eosinophil are pink rather than purple like the basophil? Well, it has to do mainly with pH. <clears throat> so neutrophils, the granules have a pH that's near seven because that's not their main job. So they don't put a lot of effort into filling up those granules. And then the, if you think the basophils, they are basically, they have basic or, or uh, high pH granules. Eosinophils, which get their name from 
it would be nice if they called them acidophils, but they didn't. Um, they call them eosinophils because they stain brightly with eosin. And that's because they have a low pH granules. So that's the main difference and why the colors are different. Did they know that these innate cells were multi-lobed before stumbling upon these uh, staining molecules? No, they didn't. And this was the first time you could really visualize the nucleus. Um, it was with staining with, with, uh, with hematoxin. So this, this whole process by Ehrlich to disprove Mechnikov really ended up giving us all the different immune cell subsets or, or a fair number of them. And we still didn't have an answer. I have a question. Yes. Um, are most of the lymphocytes that are in circulation, are those memory cells? No, most of them are not memory. A very small fraction of the cells are memory cells. Hey, uh, Dr. Botman. Yes. Uh, so I believe in the, the last lecture, you mentioned that um, we virtually have uh, like our, our T cells are going to be, or we, had, we just have immune cells that are going to roughly be able to recognize almost any pathogen. Um, is the, and then the way that they switch the DNA sequence around to recognize those, those antigens, these epitopes, is that going to be the same if uh, we encounter a pathogen that like we don't have any uh, uh, initial recognition for, or it's just yeah, completely yeah, foreign to us? So what happens is, is that, um, I'm sorry, can, can you mute yourself? If, uh, okay, so the short answer is to that is that these cells rearrange their receptors during cell development and they just make a random receptor. They don't know what they're specific for, and then they get sent out and their job is to search for th their antigen or their epitope. It doesn't rearrange it again. Well, yeah, it doesn't rearrange it again after it encounters the pathogen. It only is doing this during development before it's seen anything. And we will cover those entire processes in the second section of this semester. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I had a quick question just about the way that the B cells are recognizing soluble antigens. You said they're recognizing uh, the shape versus the T cells are being, the dendritic cells are presenting to the T cells, so they're getting those peptides. Correct. Then the B. Are the B cells then out searching for, I guess, almost in the same way that uh, the other leukocytes are, are encountering cells? Are they just kind of searching for whatever is floating through or are they? Uh, no, they, they do it very differently. And, and we're not, we're not going to cover that until we actually get to the third section of this course, which is antigen responses. With, but the short answer is that the B cells, once they get activated in a lymph node, the plasma cells just go out and or go back to the bone marrow and they just make tons of antibody that's put into the blood. Memory B cells will continue to circulate, but they're really just looking for another response and they can only start that response in a lymph node. Whereas your granulocytes and your other cell, your innate cells, they're going to the site of infection. B cells don't go to the site of infection. They're staying, their job is to do this remotely. Do the dendritic cells, once they reach a lymph node, and then you have uh, lymphocytes passing through that lymph node, do they travel to another lymph node? Is there? No, typically they just go to the draining lymph node. And I think we cover that in the next lecture. But you have a lot of lymph nodes, right? Basically everywhere from your elbows to your knees, you have lots of lymph nodes. <laughs>
Okay, any other questions? Will there be pictures of the cells on the exam? There likely will be some. I'm not going to tell you which ones, though. Okay. Okay, if I've missed any questions, either in the chat um, or um, if you want to email those to me. I'm just looking over this quickly. Hopefully Evelyn was able to respond to most of those, but if, if we missed anybody, please email me. I'm happy to answer questions by email as well. Thank you. Okay, we'll see you all on uh, Tuesday.